and welcome back to another episode of Bible Stories with Isabella Jane and Rosie. <gasps> Last week was so much fun, wasn't it? We learned how Jesus is a real superhero. That's right, Rosie. Did you know that in the Bible there are many superheroes? Really? None of them as cool as Jesus, but some really cool guys. You know, today we're going to learn about the strongest guy in the Bible. His name was Samson. I knew Samson was strong. Why? Well, Samsonite is a very strong suitcase. Not sponsored. Please sponsor me. <laughs> Rosie, today we're going to be looking in our Old Testament in the book of Judges, a very long time ago. It's all a very long time ago. It is old. So at this time, the Israelites, Rosie, were ruled over by the Philistines. <gasps> Whoa, what happened? Well, you see, the Israelites had drifted and they started worshipping other gods and idols. This is terrible! After all that God had done for them. Yeah, well Rosie, did you know that God was still going to do more for them? In fact, he was going to send a superhero to save the Israelites from the Philistines. These Israelites sure do need a lot of saving. So one day a long time ago, angels approached a, a husband and a wife. And these were in fact the future parents of our superhero, Samson. The angel said to them, you are going to have a child and this boy is going to be dedicated. He belongs to God, but you must never cut his hair. Well, why? Well, God was going to give him super strength. And if you cut his hair, all that strength would go away. So he was never going to cut his hair. Never, ever, ever. Never, ever, ever. So when Samson was big and strong, he actually fell in love with a young girl, and she was a Philistine. <gasps> Scandal! So while him and his parents were on their way to go meet this girl and have the wedding, a lion jumped out and tried to attack them. <gasps> what, what did Samson do? Samson fought the lion and actually killed it. Yeah. And then days later, after the wedding, he came across the dead lion and bees had made a hive in there. And do you know what Samson did? He ate the honey. That is disgusting. That sounds like something out of the Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit. <laughs> yeah. You know, then Samson had this riddle. I like riddles. Yeah, to tell the Philistines. He said... Out of the eater came forth the meat, and out of the strong came forth the sweetness. Uh -huh. What do you think the answer was? Well, wasn't it about the lion? Yeah, it was about the lion, but the Philistines couldn't figure this out. Really? So they actually asked his wife to go and find out what the answer was. Uh, okay. And eventually, Samson told his wife the answer, and she went and told the Philistines what the answer to this riddle was. Oh, okay, that's not so bad. It's not so bad, but Samson got angry and he left her. Wait, what? He did. No scandal. The plot thickens. This is like a reality TV show. <laughs> Except it's real. Really, really real, Rosie. So now, a while later, Samson comes back and he finds that his wife has moved on and she's married to someone new. This is insane. It's intense. This is like... Ugh. So this made Samson so mad, Rosie, that he burnt all the Philistines' crops. This guy has some serious issues. Rosie, once Samson burnt the crops, I'm sure you can imagine these Philistines were angry. So angry, they wanted to kill Samson. These guys, there's always something, isn't there? There's just, it's never simple. It just can't be simple with Samson. <sighs> so Samson fled. He, he left town, he went to a new town, and there, he actually fell in love with a new woman and her name was Delilah. 
So he married this woman, Delilah, and the Philistines actually found him and found her and they bribed Delilah to find out what Samson's weakness was because this guy was so strong, no one could beat him, so they wanted to know, what's his Achilles heel? So what did Delilah do? I'm sure they said, go away, I'm not going to tell you anything. Well, she accepted the bribe. What? No! Scandal! <laughs> so she accepted the bribe and she went and she asked Samson, What? What is your weakness? What, what can people do to defeat you? you know, I'm your wife, I want to know. And, and he actually told her a fib. He made up some story of what makes him weak and that night she tried it. And it didn't work? Nope. It didn't work. So she went back to him and she said, Okay. That, that didn't work. What, what, makes, what makes you weak? And he said, well, you can tie me up with ropes. That's my weakness. So that night the Philistines came and they tied him up with ropes. And, and it didn't work? It didn't work. So now Delilah goes back to him and she says, you've mocked me. What is going to make you weak? And he says, you can weave my hair. And she did that and it didn't work. What? So now Delilah went to Samson and she said, You've mocked me, and you've lied to me, and if you love me, you will tell me. And of course he didn't. Well, he did. Typical of the boy to go and tell her. <sighs> so he said, no one has ever put a razor to my hair. No one has ever cut my hair. And that Rosie, remember in the beginning, that's where his strength comes from. So... So did they cut his hair? They cut his hair and they locked him up. Oh no! So then he failed and God's plan didn't work. Now hold on here Rosie, God's plan always works because his hair started to grow back without anyone noticing. <gasps> and one day he started to push the pillars and the house began to fall with the Philistines inside of it. And he said, God, remember me, and I shall die with the Philistines. And did he? Yeah, Rosie, he did. So he gave up himself to save the Israelites. Yeah, Rosie. That sounds a lot like how Jesus gave up himself. Except he rose again from the dead, didn't he? Yeah, Jesus rose again, but Samson didn't. But Rosie, you can see that God used someone who had a bad temper, who was prideful, who, who made mistakes. So it proves, Rosie, that God can use anyone. It doesn't matter who he uses. It doesn't matter if this man is so strong. God is stronger and his plan always works. And the coolest part is we can see how even though we've got all these really cool superheroes, none of them were as cool as Jesus. Jesus, you're my superhero. You're my star, my best friend. Jesus, you're my superhero. You're my star, my best friend. Again! Jesus, you're my superhero. You're my star, my best friend. Jesus, I thought I'd show you what is actually hiding behind this door. And just like I'm not going to hide anything from you guys, even if it is a big mess, we learned last week that we can come to God with anything if we trust in Jesus. And this is because Jesus took our sin and the shame that comes with us upon himself so that we can come to God 
and ashamed. So, are you ready? Here goes, I'm gonna open this door in three, two, one. <gasps> well, all that's left to do now is to give this part of our house a total makeover. Wow, isn't that a total transformation? What a great makeover. Here's before and here's after. Well, today we are going to learn a little bit more about makeovers, but not the kind that changes your house or gives you a new outfit. No, we're going to learn about the makeover, the transformation of our lives that Jesus made possible when he died on the cross. To begin, we're going to look at what I think is one of the greatest transformations in the Bible. This is the great makeover of Paul. Remember Paul? He's the guy who wrote so many of the books of the New Testament. Well, he wasn't always that great. Paul's life was pretty messy, and he didn't always love and follow Jesus. Well, let's see in this video what Paul's life was like before and after he decided to follow Jesus. How many differences can you spot? This is Paul. He was a Pharisee. A Pharisee was a religious man who was an expert in the law, or the rules. The Pharisees thought that God only loved people who followed all these rules. They didn't realize that Jesus was the king that God had promised. So they persecuted people who followed Jesus. Persecuted means they punished them or treated them really badly. And Paul was the worst when it came to this. He was really mean to people who followed Jesus. Like, all kinds of mean. All because he thought that the rules were the most important thing. One day, Jesus spoke to Paul. He said, why are you persecuting me? Remember, persecuting is when you treat someone really badly. So Jesus was asking Paul why he was hurting him. That's a pretty big deal. After that, a huge bright light blinded Paul. He couldn't see for three whole days. When his sight came back, Paul realized that rules weren't the most important thing. Jesus, and following Jesus, was the most important thing. After this, Paul traveled the world and told anyone who would listen about Jesus. And his wasn't an easy life. He was put in prison, and stoned, and beaten, and flogged. He was shipwrecked three times and was lost at sea. He was hungry and thirsty. He lost his clothes and his money and his food. Basically, Paul wasn't safe anywhere he went. But Paul thought it was worth it. And for the rest of his life, Paul never stopped telling people about Jesus. Wow! That is amazing. What a complete transformation. And you know what? Just like Paul's life changed when he decided to follow Jesus, our lives changed too. When Paul trusted Jesus, two things happened. And those same two things happened to us as well. Now these are two big words, but don't worry. You've already learned the word propitiation and what that means. And if you've forgotten, you can go back and watch the videos again or ask your parents. <laughs> and I'm also going to explain a little bit more as we go on. So let's look a bit closer at this change, this transformation that happened to Paul and happens to us. The first thing that happened to Paul is what we call justification. Justification is when we are rescued from the punishment for our sin. And we've already learned all about this in the past few weeks. So with justification, when, when Paul decided to trust in Jesus, God forgave him for all his sin in the past and also for all the sin that he still was going to do in the future. God declared him not guilty. And God does the same for us. When we trust in Jesus, we don't have to pay the price for our sin anymore or get, you know, get punished for it by God. 
because Jesus has already done that for us. God forgives us when we trust in Jesus and he gives us a new label. So instead of being labeled sinful, we are declared righteous. Instead of being God's enemies, he calls us his friends. Now, that is not all. God not only rescues us from the punishment for our sin, but he also rescues us from the power that sin has over us. And this is really important. God doesn't just forgive us, declare us righteous, amazing as that is, and then leave us in that way. No, that wouldn't make sense. I mean, imagine if we went from being God's enemies to being his friends, but we still carried on living as if we are his enemies. God doesn't want sin to still be a part of our lives. Something has to happen then for us to be able to say no to sin and to obey God instead. And this is the second thing that happened to Paul and that happens to us when we follow Jesus that we'll be focusing on today. Are you ready for this word? This is called sanctification. Can you say that? Sanctification. Great. Sanctification is the transformation, the makeover that takes place. It means to make holy or to set apart. This is when God looks at us and says, now that you are my friend, I'm going to change you and help you live a life that shows you are my friend. So when God justifies us, when he forgives us, he sees us as if we are holy. But over time, our hearts and our minds and our actions change so that we live as the holy people we are. Remember in the video how Paul's life was different before he decided to follow Jesus and after? I mean, before he would do anything to stop people from following Jesus and he treated Jesus' followers in a really bad way. But afterwards, his life changed so much that he was prepared to die so that people could hear about Jesus and know him and follow him too. And that change is sanctification. And for us as well, when we see a difference from before we follow Jesus to afterwards, that is God sanctifying us. And he also changes us so that our lives as people who love Jesus look different from other people who don't know him yet. Now, how does this happen? How is sanctification possible? Well, the answer is in 1 Peter 2, verse 24 to 25. And we're going to read that now. And I wonder if you can spot some similarities from the, in the verse that we learned about last week. Peter actually mentions quite a lot of Isaiah 53 here. Let's read together. He, this is Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So what we see in this verse is that when Jesus died on the cross, we died as well. Now, hang on. You might be thinking, Antone, that is crazy. I wasn't there 2,000 years ago when that happened. And as far as I know, I'm still alive today. <laughs> that's not really what it, that's not quite what it means. What it's saying is that that part of us that wants to sin and that chooses to turn away from God, that part dies when we trust in Jesus and we're given a new life, a new heart that want to obey God and that want to live holy lives. So when we trust in Jesus, sin's power over us is defeated 
and Jesus becomes the king, the ruler of our hearts. We no longer live for sin, but we live for Jesus. And all of this happens because when we trust in Jesus, we get the Holy Spirit, who is also God. And the Holy Spirit works to change us day by day. Now this transformation is a complete makeover. It changes our minds, our hearts, and our actions and words. So with this change, everything about us becomes more and more like Jesus. Perfect. So our thoughts begin to please God. Our desires are to love God and to obey Him. And our actions and words can glorify God and make others look at our lives and want to follow Jesus too. Now, there are a few more things we need to understand about sanctification. The first is that it happens over time. It is a process. When we trust in Jesus, we are forgiven for our sin. It's a done deal. But then over time, God changes our hearts and our minds and our actions until we are completely like Jesus, completely holy. God already sees us as if we are holy, but it takes time for everything about us to change and get there. But here's the good news. God won't give up on us until his work is finished. He won't stop changing us until we are completely perfect like Jesus. Well, the second thing we need to remember is that sin has no power over us if we trust in Jesus. So while we are being sanctified, we will still struggle with sin. I struggle every day. Um, it is really hard sometimes to say no to sin and to say yes to God's way instead. But we know in those moments that Jesus is in control. He has defeated sin. We know this because when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't stay dead. No, he rose again on the third day and he is alive in heaven now. So, sin has no power over Jesus. And if we belong to him, it has no power over us either. God will help us to say no to sin and to say yes to him. The third thing we need to know is that God is the one doing the work. God does the sanctification. We can't change our hearts on our own. No matter how hard we try, we can't obey God and live lives that are holy in our own strength. God is the one who does this for us. He changes our minds and our hearts and our actions. But... At the same time, God wants us to join him in the work that he does. So it's like your teacher at school. Your teacher can explain everything to you and teach all the lessons. But at the end of the day, you need to go and write the exam. <laughs> well, God does all the work. But we need to join him as he is busy changing us. How do we do that? Well, I can think of quite a few ways, but there are at least three that I think are really important. So the first thing is that we read our Bibles. God speaks to us through the Bible. It's his word. And when we read our Bibles or hear someone read it to us or even hear someone teach us about the Bible like a church, God shows us who he is so we get to know him better and he shows us how he wants us to live. When we read our Bibles, we also can see where we might be sinning in our lives and how we need to change to be more like Jesus. But God also reminds us in the Bible of everything that Jesus has done for us so that we can be forgiven for our sin and be made new. The second thing we can do is to pray. When we pray, we show that we need God and we rely on him. 
and in our prayers we can talk to God about our sin and we can tell him where we are struggling to say no to it and ask him to keep helping us. The third thing we can do is to spend time with other people who follow Jesus. When we spend time with other Christians, especially when they've been Christians for a bit longer than us, we can see what it's like to live a holy life and learn from their example. And they can also encourage us and help us to keep going. Well, I hope this week that you all know that Jesus died for you so that you can be rescued from the punishment for your sin, but also so that you can be rescued from the power of sin. May we all obey God this week, not to earn his love and to be rescued by him, but may we obey him because we are loved by him and because we have been rescued by him through Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everything you have done for us. Thank you that we are rescued not only from the punishment for our sin, but also from the power of it, and that you change us each day to live a life that is holy and that looks like Jesus. God, I pray that you'll keep changing us and um, help other people to see in the way that we live, that we love Jesus and follow him and And may they also want to follow him too. Thank you, Lord, also that you forgive us for every time we still may sin when we trust in Jesus. We pray all of this in Jesus' name.